Vale. Bueno, va a menditugu el ensayo académico a Azteco, Gurekin, em, Gorka Espiau, Aguirre Lendakari Center Recoquidea, Berak Gaur Discasant Lana Eringo du Gurekin, eta seguraski moderatza ye Lana Ere, Ben Estabaida Irekitzen de Gunean. E, gero Alan Gagno, Laukagu, que ve que co Universitate co Ciencia Político etaco Sayeco Catedra Duna. Vera, e, programa ni custe su embecela, Vigarren, Chanda, Batea, Nice, Ingodú. Eta, Orain, e, Graham, Every Haunarekin, así cogerá. Vera, Bruselas, co Europa, Batasuneco, Política, en Centro, co Aul, Culari, Edo, Conchellari, Adam. Oxford, co San Antonis, College, co Kidea. Eta, Europa, Batasuneco, Oresco, Susendari, Nagusia. E, campo, Arremanetaraco, Conchellu, Oroco, Reco, Estrategia. Coordinación y análisis al orreco su senda y cargo, anaritu senas que necualdis, europar batasunean, eta emen e, gureki gureartean eukidegu, eukigenu embarcatu urtarri yeanere ehu gunek e, antola tutaco jardunal batean escociari burusco a estanzana y gor filiberekin batera. Eta besterigabe, I'm gonna give you the, the word Graham so you can start. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Julie, for your introduction. And thank you. And thank you for your kind. I'm not sure that this is working well. Hmm? Okay, is that is that functioning correctly? <coughs> is that functioning? Good, good, good. Well, thank you very much, Julie, for your introduction, and thank you for your invitation. It, it's a privilege for me to speak here <coughs> at this conference, which brings together, I believe, for the first time, all the universities of the Basque Country. Um, I think your motto, like the motto of the European Union, is unity in diversity. And I have to say I want to quote also the motto of the Society for Basque Studies, which is Ashmos et uh, with will and with knowledge. So those are the mottos under which I place my speech. And I'm very pleased to be here in Donostia. Um, <coughs> I, it's the most beautiful city in the Basque Country. I visited Bilbao in January of this year. It's a fascinating place, but it's not so beautiful as Donostia. <coughs> in the past, your, your city has seen war and violence. It was attacked in the past by the Spanish, the Portuguese, even by the English. And in the 20th century, you suffered from Spain's difficult history. But today, you live in this region in stability and prosperity within the European Union. And it's the European Union that I want to talk about this morning. <clears throat> I worked for 33 years for the European Commission in Brussels, and I'm proud to have contributed in a modest way to, to the construction of Europe. I was a policy advisor and a strategist, working for different politicians. My most exciting and important tasks in Brussels were related to the enlargement of the European Union, which has grown from six members at the beginning to 28 members today. And I was one of the big, one of the architects of the big enlargement from 15 to 27 members, in which we were joined by the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. <coughs> that was more than enlargement of the European Union; it was a reunification of Eastern Europe and Western Europe, which had been divided for a generation 
by the Iron Curtain. That was the Europe of the past, and the title of this session is The Future of Europe. Well, it's a very big question, and uh, I could talk about it for hours. So, so let me just be very brief and say in just two or three minutes at the beginning of my presentation what I see as the main challenges for the European Union today. We have an extremely difficult economic situation in Europe. High unemployment, low growth. So the first priority for Europe's leaders must be the economy. We need to move from austerity to sustainable growth without plunging into unsustainable debt. Second, in Europe, we face a grave challenge in the East where Russia's military actions in Ukraine and before that in Georgia <coughs> have broken most of the rules of international conduct that we built up for 50 years after the Second War. We must ensure that the Europeans remain united in dealing with this threat. It's not just a question of the territorial integrity of these other European countries, it's a question of helping their people to make the political and economic reforms that they need in order to reach European standards of governance. Third point, and here's the good news, this year the European Union renewed all of its institutions and its leaders. A new European Parliament was elected, a new European Commission took office in October with Jean-Claude Juncker as its president, and a few days ago at the beginning of December, Donald Tusk, former Prime Minister of Poland, took up the post of President of the European Council. I believe that with these new leaders, we can expect new initiatives and new solutions to European problems. Now I'm going to address the specific question of my talk this morning, which is the question of independentism and the European Union. I'm going to reflect with you on what is the European Union's policy on self-determination? What is the attitude of the European Union to independence referendums in Scotland and in other regions? What lessons can we draw from that for the future of independence movements, uh, including here in the Basque Country? Now, before I try to answer these questions, I have to make <clears throat> a few declarations of a personal nature. First of all, I have to tell you, I am not English. Um, I was born in Wales. My mother is Welsh, so my nationality is Welsh. Um, I have a British passport, and my citizenship is European. And these three overlapping identities give me, I hope, a good approach to these questions of international affairs. Second point, although I worked for many years for the European Commission, I left it eight years ago uh, and I no longer represent the European Commission here. What I say today is my personal point of view. It's not the official position of the organization that used to employ me or of any of the European institutions. Third, I was involved in the last two years in the debate on Scottish independence, but, but not as a partisan. My role was as an independent analyst trying to explain in an objective way to the Scottish the role of the European Union. Um, and here in Spain and in the Basque Country, I want to insist that I'm neutral on the question of independence. My aim is to clarify and explain the European dimension to this debate uh, and to, I hope, uh, give some light in a debate where sometimes there is more heat than light. So l let me say that um, separatism and independence are not new questions in Europe. Since 1945, and particularly since 1990, many newly independent states have emerged in Europe. Most of them began their independence, first of all, outside the European Union, and then asked for membership of the European Union. 
I'm thinking here of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, they regained their independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Then the Czech Republic and Slovakia were created out of Czechoslovakia's velvet divorce. And later, seven states emerged from the disintegration of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And those seven states uh, are um, uh, Slovenia and Croatia, who are now members of the European Union, Serbia and Montenegro, who are now in negotiation for membership of the European Union, Macedonia, or more correctly, the former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Kosovo, which is not yet recognized by the European Union or by five of its member states. The last three states that I mentioned, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Macedonia, are not yet in negotiations for membership, but they too have the promise of membership when they satisfy the conditions. And the same is true for Albania. And there are other countries in Eastern Europe which gained independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but are not yet in the official process of joining the European Union. And I refer here to the other Europeans in Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Independence is not a new phenomenon, even within the European Union for its member states. In the past, parts of the national territory of both France and Denmark gained independence. Algeria became independent from France in 1962. Greenland became independent of Denmark in the 1980s. But both those territories chose not to remain in the European Union. So what the European Union has never yet experienced uh, is the division of one of its member states into two states, both of which choose to remain um, within the European Union. Um, although the basic treaties of Europe have always pri provided for new members to join, and the procedure for accession is set out in Article 49 of the treaty, and more recently, uh, there is a procedure for members to leave, that's the procedure for secession <coughs> in Article 50, um, the basic treaties make no provision uh, for the division of one member state into two. And that's why the situation in Belgium, in Scotland, and in Catalonia pose a question for which there's no precedent in the history of the European Union and no legal provision <coughs> in the treaties of the European Union. Now, I mention Flanders, Scotland, and Catalonia because I think these are the three most prominent cases of independentism in the European Union today. There are other independence movements in many other regions, here in the Basque Country, of course, but also in the South Tyrol in Italy, in Corsica in France, in the Shekeli land in Romania, and so on. Uh, and also, I should add, in my own native country, in Wales. Um, but I don't think support for independence in these regions has reached the same momentum as in Flanders, Scotland, and Catalonia. And I will comment on those three cases in more detail later in my speech. Uh, I want to analyze now the following questions. <clears throat> What is the European Union's policy on independentism? Second, is the division of one member state into two member states a good thing or a bad thing for the European Union? And thirdly, I want to reflect on the question of how the structure and the functioning of the European Union is relevant to independentism. So what is the European Union's policy on independentism, on, 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 on the questions which are under debate here in Spain? Well, the fact is that not much can be said in direct reply to this question because it has never yet been addressed by the European institutions. 
The European treaties say nothing about self-determination and they are silent on the question of independence. It's true that the Treaty of the European Union does mention the territorial integrity of states in the list of its basic principles. Article 4, paragraph 2 of the treaty says, and I quote, the Union shall respect the equality of member states before the treaties, as well as their national identities, inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional, inclusive of regional and local self-government. It shall respect their essential state functions, including ensuring the, inter the territorial integrity of the state, maintaining law and order, and safeguarding national security. In particular, national security remains the sole responsibility of each member state. End of quotation. But it's obvious that what is said in the treaty about territorial integrity is not a guarantee that the existing geographical definition of the member states will continue in perpetuity. It simply says that territorial integrity is considered to be a function of the member state and that the European Union respects this. The treaty certainly hasn't prevented the European Union from accepting the redefinition by several member states of their geographical territory. That was the case not only for the independence of Algeria and Greenland, which I mentioned, but also for other changes concerning the dependent territories, the ex-colonies of some of the member states, and last but not least, for the reunification of Germany East and West, which took place in 1990. So plainly within the European Union, frontiers can change. But one thing we learn from the passage in the treaty that I just quoted is that it's a basic principle of the European Union to respect the constitutional arrangements of its member states. And this principle has been scrupulously observed by the European institutions, by the Council of Ministers, by the Parliament, by the Commission. In fact, one can say that on the question of independentism in member states, the policy of the European institutions is not to have a policy but rather to respect the constitutional arrangements of the member states. And it follows from this that no European institution and no member state challenged the decision of London to allow a referendum on Scottish independence. Um, uh, although Britain doesn't have a written constitution, the Scottish referendum was plainly part of a constitutional process authorized by the national parliament and the head of state. In addition, no European institution and no member state of the European Union has challenged the view of Madrid that the independence of Catalonia is contrary to the national constitution. And I quote the Spanish constitution, it's based on the indissoluble unity of the Spanish nation, the common and indivisible homeland of all Spaniards. End of quotation. Of course, the Catalonians would argue that this doesn't prevent the holding of a referendum, but it's a fact, it's a simple fact, that other EU member states do not wish to challenge Madrid's interpretation of the Spanish constitution. After all, the other member states don't want Madrid or anyone else to begin to interpret their own national constitutions. But of course, even if the European Union has no explicit policy on independentism, we can nevertheless try to analyze whether it has an implicit policy by looking at, by examining its actions or reactions in relation to actual cases of independence. We can deduce what is the implicit policy of the European Union by considering not what it says in the treaties, but what it actually does in practice. Now, as I said at the beginning, outside the European Union, we've seen many new states created in Central and Eastern Europe since 1990. Most European commentators 
would agree that the creation of these new states and their pursuit of democratic stability and economic progress has been a success story and that the European Union itself has contributed notably to this process by offering the incentive of membership of the European Union. And it's interesting to note that um, uh, uh, of the eight countries of the Western Balkans that I mentioned, two have already become members of the European Union, that's uh, Slovenia and Croatia, and we are helping the other six to make the reforms necessary to qualify for membership. So the European Union has played an active role in the creation of stable new states in Europe. As a generalization, we can say that the initial attitude of the European Union and its member states, at the beginning, its initial attitude has been to resist or discourage the division of other European states into smaller units. There's a national preference among governments, among diplomats, for the status quo. Um, they're always worried that change may create uncertainty and lead to political problems. And this attitude was very public and visible, first of all at the time when the Soviet Union disintegrated, uh, and secondly when Yugoslavia began to disintegrate. Most European governments hesitated initially to accept or encourage that process of change. But when independence is imminent or has become an established fact, then the reaction of the European Union and its member states has been to deal with the situation and try to find remedies for any problems. That was the case for the situation in the Balkans uh, with the breakup of Yugoslavia and subsequently in the breakup of Serbia because uh, Serbia was broken up uh, a bit later when Montenegro declared independence in 2006 and Kosovo in 2008. And the reaction of the European Union to these two episodes, Montenegro and Kosovo, is illuminating. When Montenegro decided to have a referendum on independence, the European Union was not enthusiastic until Serbia, the mother country, agreed reluctantly to accept the Montenegro referendum as a constitutional process. And then the European Union, together with the Council of Europe, not only supervised the referendum in Montenegro, but fixed the parameters for the validity of the result. In the referendum in Montenegro, there was a very, very narrow majority for yes, but nevertheless, Montenegro's independence was immediately recognized by all members of the European Union, including Spain. But then there was the case of Kosovo. When Kosovo held a referendum and Serbia refused to accept it, the European Union found itself in disarray and disagreement. Most members of the European Union recognized the new state of Kosovo. But <coughs> five members, that's Spain, Slovakia, Romania, Cyprus and Greece, refused to recognize Kosovo and continue to refuse because they consider that Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence could create a precedent for independentists in their own countries. In this country, of course, for Catalonians and Basques, in Slovakia and Romania, they're worried about the Hungarians, and for Cyprus and Greece, the concern was with the Turkish Cypriots in the north of Cyprus. Now, the, these two cases that I've mentioned, Montenegro and Kosovo, demonstrate how the question of constitutional validity has been a key factor for the European Union in deciding how to respond to independence. Although in Kosovo, although it's not recognized by several members or nor by the European Union, nevertheless, the process of stabilization and reconstruction and preparation for EU membership has been well engaged by the European Union. And Serbia, for its part, understands well that the normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo is a precondition for the success of Serbia in its ambition to join the European Union. 
And when this normalization proceeds, we can expect the five remaining EU members, including Spain, eventually to recognize Kosovo. So in summary, to this part of my presentation, I want to say that the implicit policy of the European Union in relation to independentism consists of initial reluctance, followed by pragmatic acceptance, provided that the process leading to independence <coughs> can be considered as constitutional. And this is a fundamentally important point. The question of constitutionality has been a key factor for the European Union's members, more recently in relation to the referendums that have taken place in Ukraine, first in Crimea and later in Donetsk and other regions uh, of, of eastern Ukraine. Uh, and the, our leaders of the European Union have been very clear in their attitude. They announced, the European Council announced in March, 19, in March 2014, the European Council declared that it does not recognize the illegal referendum in Crimea, which is in clear violation of the Ukrainian constitution, unquote. Now, <clears throat> um, I want to address now the question, is the division of one member state into two member states good or bad for the European Union? But please note that the question I'm trying to address it's not a particular case of independence, such as Scotland or Catalonia. I'm not saying, is the independence of Scotland or Catalonia good for the European Union, or good for Britain, or good for Spain? The question I'm trying to address is a more general one. Is the transformation of one member state into two member states good or bad for the European Union as such? Well, it can certainly be argued that when you increase the number of member states, you make the functioning of the European institutions and the decision-making process more complicated. But, but this isn't such a negative argument. It's not so convincing. Successive enlargements of the European Union in the last 40 years have increased its membership from 6 to 28 without paralyzing the decision-making. It may be more complicated if you have more members voting, but it's not necessarily more difficult for the main institutions, the Council and the Parliament, to take decisions by majority, by qualified majority, when they vote. And there are some game theorists who even argue that with more actors, it's easier to find majority solutions. Naturally, in, in, in areas of policy where the European Union decides by unanimity, not by majority, th then there's a greater risk of paralysis as a result of having more actors. But experience shows that it's the big member states, it's the big bad boys and girls who exercise vetoes. The small and medium-sized states use them much more rarely. Now, in the scenario that I'm considering, where one member state divides into two, the resulting increase in the number of member states isn't accompanied by any change, either in the population of the European Union or in its economic size. By definition, its population and its economic size remain the same. And therefore, um, the size of the internal market, the functioning of the internal market is not affected, and the external influence of the European Union, the power of the European Union in terms of its negotiating uh, weight in fields like trade, the external influence of the Union isn't diminished either. In fact, you could even argue that the European Union's weight in international affairs is increased if it gains an additional seat and more votes in the United Nations and other international organizations. Does the European Union have a preference for smaller states or bigger states? Well, the answer to that is certainly not. One of the principles, which I quoted earlier, is that the European Union, I quote, respects the equality of member states, unquote. But everyone knows that in the system of decision-making, 
the European Union does have a bias, a systemic bias, in favor of smaller states for deciding the number of seats in the European Parliament and the number of votes in the Council, smaller states are overrepresented in terms of population. They have relatively more voting power than the bigger states. This is known in the technical jargon as digressive proportionality. The smaller you are, the better vote you have. And um, uh, there's a very good reason, a historic and political reason for this. It's designed to give the smaller states a reassurance that they won't be dominated by the bigger states as they were in history. So I conclude this part of my analysis by saying that for me, there's no conclusive argument to suggest that the division of one member state into two is good or bad for the European Union. On balance, it's neutral. This doesn't mean that the division of a member state into two can't be opposed by individual member states in particular cases and for various reasons. But it can't be opposed on the grounds that it weakens the European Union or is contrary to the basic principles or interests of the European Union. Let me develop this reflection a bit further and examine the question which aspects of the structure of the European Union are relevant to this question of independentism. Since the beginning, the European Union has been a multinational, multi-level system with elements of supranationality. It has allowed member states to upload various national functions to the European level, starting with competition policy and international trade, and more recently, economic policy, environment policy, even foreign policy. Um, initially in the 1960s, we only had two levels of governance, European and national, but from the 1980s onwards, the situation has developed with devolution in many member states and more autonomy in the regions. In fact, the principle of subsidiarity in the EU treaty now identifies four different levels of governance, European, national, regional and local. And it's evident that local and regional entities <coughs> have begun to enjoy increased opportunities for action and negotiation in European affairs. <coughs> in 1994, <coughs> the European Union responded to this by creating the Committee of, Reg the Committee of Regions in Brussels, which is now a European institution, because it realized that the regions want a voice in the European Union's institutional setup. But this development, the Committee of Regions, hasn't given much satisfaction. It's a talking shop. It's not a place where decisions are taken. Meanwhile, although the European Parliament has obtained more power, the focus of decision-making in the European Union is the Council of Ministers and the European Council. In other words, power still remains mostly with the member states. And if we add to this the digressive pro proportionality principle, we can understand how independentists are motivated to seek the status of EU membership. Without the European Union, it would be much more difficult to transform a subnational entity into a nation state, which has to perform complex functions in many fields. Within the European Union, <coughs> EU membership doesn't eliminate the need for national functions, but allows important parts of them to be uploaded to the supranational level. So my conclusion to this part of my presentation is to say that in dealing with independentism today, the member states of the European Union, they're entitled to insist on the principles of democracy and constitutionalism, but they should accept that in relation to the European Union, independents are entitled to follow the logic of the structure that member, member states devised themselves. A structure in which the supranational European dimension allows states, small and big, to perform their national functions more effectively. Now I want to conclude by um, 
discussing, as I promised, <coughs> the three cases of independentism that I mentioned earlier. Flanders, Scotland, and Catalonia. As I said, there are other regions, including this one, where independence movements exist, but these are, I think, the three most prominent cases. And I begin with Belgium, not just because I lived there for 33 years, but because it's the member state of the European Union um, where federalism is probably the most advanced and the independence debate is probably the most mature. After all, the linguistic divide between Flemish spoken in Flanders and French spoken in Wallonia has deep roots in the history of Belgium. In fact, it goes back for more than a thousand years. Anyway, <clears throat> Flemish nationalists have gained an increasing number of seats in the parliament. In the national elections in 2010, the new Flemish alliance campaigned on a platform of independence for Flanders, and it got 28% of the vote in Flanders and 17% of the national vote. So the new Flemish alliance is in fact the largest party both in Flanders and in Belgium as a whole. But despite this, independence for Flanders and the divorce of Belgium is not really on the horizon. The main difficulty is the existence of Brussels, the capital city which has one million inhabitants and is a bilingual region neither in Flanders nor in Wallonia. The Flemish speakers and the French speakers could never agree on the future status of Brussels if Belgium split up. After all, it's the financial and business capital of Belgium. Uh, neither side could surrender Brussels to the other. So in Belgium, it's unlikely, although not impossible, that Flanders will become independent in the coming years. I turn next to Scotland. Now, I'm not going to say much about Scotland because uh, later this afternoon you have Stephen Noon from Scotland who's going to talk to you about his fascinating experience in the referendum there. So I'm going to say very briefly four things. First of all, my role in the debate in Scotland was not as a partisan, not as a participant in favour of Scottish national nationalism, but rather as a commentator and an, an analyst trying to inject some common sense into the discussion because the European Union figured quite large in the Scottish debate. Those who were opposed to Scottish independence, the Unionists in London, uh, often used the European Union as a big handicap to independence. They exaggerated it in an absurd way. For example, it was argued that if the Scottish people voted for independence, they would have to leave the European Union um, and get in the queue behind Turkey for membership and it could take five or ten years to rejoin. Uh, this seemed to me completely absurd and my argument was that if the Scottish had voted yes, uh, then a way would have been found, a pragmatic way would have been found by the European Union so that Scottish membership of the European Union could take effect on the same day as Scottish independence. I'm sorry to say that the President of the European Commission, or the then President of the European Commission, uh, José Manuel Barroso, uh, intervened in the debate in a way which was uh, very negative. Um, he, he said in a television interview that for Scotland to join the European Union would be difficult well, up to then I could agree with him. Uh, but then he added three killer words. He said, for Scotland to join the European Union would be difficult if not impossible, which frankly uh, I think was incorrect. Um, after all, uh, in the last 10 years, of the 13 countries which joined the European Union, with the full assistance of the European Commission, seven of these 13 countries had recently gained or regained independence. My second point is a more fundamental point about the British experience with Scotland. Now, I have to say, I am not a big fan of Mr. Cameron. I disagree profoundly with many of Mr. Cameron's policies, and in particular, with the position he's been taking on British membership of the European Union. His threat that he may leave the European Union, 
I find is simply unacceptable. Nevertheless, I have to say that his decision um, to accept that there should be that there could be a referendum in Scotland was a wise and intelligent decision. And I think the best comment on that, which I've which I read during the whole time, was made by a British journalist in the Financial Times. Gideon Rachman wrote this, and I quote. He said, morally and practically, the United Kingdom can be kept together only on the basis of consent. The British brand, the British mark, is built around tolerance, the role of law and democracy, and there is no better demonstration of these values than the Scottish referendum, unquote. I think that encapsulated very well what I think uh, about the Scottish referendum. Another distinguished journalist, Theo Sommer, a German journalist, wrote after the referendum, governments must learn from the Scottish example that there is only one way to, av to avoid secession. You need to yield gracefully, gracefully, to the reasonable demands of those who seek autonomy. End of quotation. Third point I want to make about Scotland is that Paradoxically, when Mr. Cameron uh, decided with um, Alex Salmond on the question to be put in the referendum, th there was a vigorous discussion where the Scottish nationalists wanted a three-part question. They wanted the Scottish people to answer yes or no, but also, do you want a middle way? Do you want more autonomy? London refused categorically to have a three-part question. It has to be yes or no. But what was the result? In the end, London was obliged to promise the middle way, and so the answer to the referendum was the middle question. Now Scotland has been promised a much greater degree of autonomy, and in fact, within the United Kingdom, a federal system of government, governance is, is about to be constructed. Um, and a new debate has begun in my country, and I think in other parts of Europe, examining what independence really means, to what extent is it autonomy, to what extent is it self-governance, and federalism is a lively question again in my country. Last but not least, uh, I want to address the case of Catalonia, and next to Catalonia, the Basque country, which naturally follows and observes closely what's happening in Catalonia. Now, here I must be prudent. I must be diplomatic. Uh, you in Spain, you do not need advice from outsiders like me on how to conduct your affairs. The experience in the Scottish debate was that interventions from outsiders, from non-British persons, like Barroso and others, they were not appreciated and was sometimes even counterproductive. After all, independence is an intensely national question. It concerns the identity and the aspirations of those who live in the country, and the views and the ideas of foreigners are not really so pertinent to the debate. So I'm going to limit myself to three very simple brief remarks. First, we in the rest of the European Union observe the situation that's developing in Catalonia with concern. We worry to see a situation in another European country where there is an open dispute between the national government and an important region. We, as outsiders, we can't resolve that dispute, but we hope very much that it can be resolved on the basis of dialogue and consensus. Second point, and my second point is not good news for, for some of those who aspire to independence for Catalonia and other regions in Spain. As I've explained, the European Union and its member states have demonstrated in the last two years that they make a fundamental distinction between what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. The European Union made no objection to the Scottish referendum, but it has, in the strongest terms, denounced the referendums that took place in Ukraine. 
And in the dispute that is opened up between Barcelona and Madrid, the other member states will not want to dispute Madrid's interpretation of the Spanish constitution. My third point, and this is better news for the independentists, is that the Scottish referendum demonstrated clearly that wanting the right to decide is not the same thing as wanting to be independent. Uh, they need to understand that in Madrid. After all, the government in London accepted the challenge of a debate and a referendum on Scottish independence, and the result was, was not only a democratic decision, but an agreement on increased autonomy that should satisfy the wishes of the Scottish people. I think that political leaders in Madrid should reflect on this result. In a family, in a marriage, there has to be dialogue, there has to be communication. To say no is not a dialogue, yet is not an intelligent response. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for, for your wise and wonderful presentation. Um, my, my role is to challenge some of your ideas and to <coughs> generate a bit of a discussion for the afternoon uh, session. Uh, so questions like, what is the um, scientific uh, foundation of your statement about the beautiful uh, San Sebastian and Bilbao? And uh, what is uh, exactly, uh, but in a, in a more uh, serious uh, term, uh, I, have a, I would have suge uh, a suggestion as well for your next talk in the, in the Basque Country, because uh, you were referring to us as uh, uh, being in Spain. And probably if you ask to the audience here, there will be a lot of people who will feel like, like they are in Spain and they feel Spanish, but probably a lot of them will feel like yeah, they are in the Basque country and you are not in Spain. So there will be like um, uh, just a humble uh, suggestion for a, for a future. In terms of the um, content of your, um, um, of your presentation, um, you have made a very uh, pragmatic um, um, positive analysis of the European Union and the way that the European Union deals with uh, these issues. But um, when we see from, from the outside, uh, uh, without having been like yourself uh, in the middle of all these discussions, the perception is that the European Union is just a, a club of a states, a club of states where only the big uh, states really have a the possibility to take decisions. So if you today, apart from Germany, France, UK, um, Spain, they give us Spain a little bit of uh, um, room because of the size of the economy and the impact that the failure in the economy could have in the, in the rest of the European Union. But it is very difficult for small nations to feel that uh, we really can take decisions or, or have a, a more uh, prominent role in the um, in the union, so my question will be: Don't you think that if uh, things continue being like this, uh, it, there may be a point where small nations just feel like the European Union is not for us, is not the right place for us? Because all uh, if we follow the discussion in Scotland, as you were uh, describing, officially, and you were totally right there. The president of the commission has no uh, uh, right to, to say that, but, but they keep it saying it all the time. And if you go to a press conference and you just, uh, ask about Catalonia or the Basque Country, normally the response you will get, it will be a very, very traditional uh, kind of uh, response from the, uh, from the officials. So, um, I mean, there, there, there's, there are reasons to believe that small nations can actually be very successful in Europe uh, outside the European Union. And there are a lot of examples. So my question will be, you know, what do you think about this? Because uh, sometimes 
uh, um, the discussion I mean, or the European Commission uh, believe that all small nations won't want to be part of the European Union, but it, there may be a point where, where there is not uh, any more the case. Uh, and uh, the s my, my second question is about the, um, the socioeconomic uh, model that you were also um, uh, referring to at the beginning of the presentation. And you were talking about the new uh, leaders that have been appointed uh, and you are hoping to have new, new uh, um, solutions coming from those new leaders. But it's very difficult to see how th these new leaders who are advocating for the old solutions are going to come up with new solutions or new crea uh, uh, a creative idea. So, um, and there is also, if you follow the discussion in Scotland and Catalonia, there is a fundamental change uh, in the uh, um, nature of the discussion because in the past it will be a discussion about uh, um, independence because of, the pol of political and democratic reasons, but not so much about the socio-economic model. While at the moment, both in Catalonia and in Scotland, the discussion about the socio-economic model that is against what the European uh, Union is advocating for has been at the top of the agenda. Uh, and you cannot understand the majority of Catalans that are advocating for independence without understanding their um, uh, demand for a different socioeconomic um, um, status. So my question will be, if, you know, d d don't you think there is also a f fundamental change there in the um, discussion that is going to emerge in the, in the next few, few years? Thank you. Yes, you can. You can. Uh, do you want to uh, to decide? Do you want to collect the questions? Yeah, you prefer that. Vai, no lo iré aquí piscate ta. Bueno, vai, no lo iré aquí piscato anja de esta vaida caldera que he tenido así eta caldera es como alguien más de b b round de dos b side b se ha tan he ido de algún. Pero hasta ahora. Su invitarte a Nick el caldera va a buscar. Um, Graham, I, I'm gonna make you a, a question yeah, in English, so don't worry. Um, so don't worry. Uh, my question would be, I mean, it's related with the last uh, time you were here, but uh, you spoke um, also um, about the same thing. So taking into account that the continental Europe, there's no such British democratic culture and division you have there between nation and state firstly and secondly taking into account that the european union is not a union of nations but of states do you see feasible or plausible that the euro that the european union can in the short term um, become a plurinational federation and if not is there any other democratic alternative or set of institutional mechanisms to distribute power systematically, if not constitutionally, amongst all the political communities of Europe in equal terms? Because that's, in the end, um, the question uh, which is related with what Gorka Spiau actually asked you. Okay, yeah, because there are no questions still, so <laughs> <laughs> you can go on, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, um, one of your remarks was <coughs> that the European Union is perceived <coughs> to be a club of states where only the big have the possibility to take decisions. Well, I, I can't dispute that that is a perception that some people have, but it's false. Uh, the, one of the most important developments in the European Union in the last 10 years, in, in the recent treaties, particularly in, in the Lisbon Treaty, was the transfer of more powers to the European Parliament. Um, decisions on most important topics in Brussels are now taken not just by the states, not just by the ministers meeting in the council, but in a double decision procedure in which the European Parliament is involved. Um, you have representatives to the European Parliament. Uh, it's up to you to decide who to elect and how they should represent you. But the rise of the European Parliament is the most important development of a constitutional nature in the European Union. 
Now, I would be the first to say that the European Parliament has not always used its new powers effectively or, or even intelligently, but it's there and it's a very important mechanism which you need to use. Secondly, you said, the big are the only ones who have the possibility to take decisions. That's simply not true. Of course, big countries are big, and therefore in a democratic system you have to accept that uh, they have a certain more say than the smaller countries. But as I explained, small countries have rights within the European Union, and, and frankly, they have much better rights within the European Union than countries which are outside. Um, smaller countries um, uh, are often in charge of the European institutions. Look at Jean-Claude Juncker, he, he's from Luxembourg, uh, one of the smallest countries. Um, uh, and um, uh, in the system of qualified majority voting, which applies to most of the decision-making in the European Union, uh, the increase in the number of members of the European Union, the bringing in of many more medium and small-sized countries, means that when you have a majority vote, uh, you can even outvote the bigger countries by the smaller countries. So the situation is not so clean-cut as you say. Now, um, you went on to mention that if this continues, small countries may begin to feel that the European Union is not the best place for them, it's not the right place uh, for a small country. Well, I think that's um, a profound mistake. It would be madness for a small country to leave the European Union. It would be madness for a big country like my country to leave the European <coughs> Union, um, particularly uh, in a world uh, where other big powers are beginning to have more influence, both economically and politically, um, we Europeans can only act effectively together if we speak with one voice. <clears throat> now, of course, there are small countries in Europe, outside the European Union, which are doing quite well. Uh, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, but you may have noticed all those three countries are damn rich they can afford the luxury of being outside. Um, all the smaller and poorer countries, they want to join. And even the Norwegians, I like the Norwegians very much, I respect them, it's a wonderful country, but they are the first to say that their um, relationship with the European Union is profoundly unsatisfactory. They have to accept um, three quarters of the decisions that are taken in Brussels, and they have no voice, they have no vote, they have no say in making the decisions. <clears throat> so I think um, anyone who imagines that it would be better outside, it's a mistake. And as I explained in my presentation, um, for smaller new countries, uh, it's far easier to conduct uh, your national affairs if you can rely on the supranational organization to take over some of the functions. <clears throat> On the question of the socio-economic model, well, um, that's a big debate which we're going to see particularly the European Parliament engage in. Um, uh, personally, um, uh, although I regret the austerity with which we're living, uh, let's be clear that that's been imposed on us by a sequence of unhappy events, uh, a banking crash, um, the irresponsibility of some of our governments in borrowing too much, and we have to emerge from this austerity. But when we do, I'm convinced that the socio-economic model of the European Union will revive and go in a better way. Um, you asked, Julie, whether there's some scope within the European Union for new arrangements where nations uh, can have a, a better role, a more important say. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't think uh, there's a positive answer to that. Um, I don't think um, that the European institutions are going to accept to complicate the decision process even further. Um, what they are beginning to understand, and I sense this in people I listen to throughout Europe, 
is that the Scottish experience shows that there is a valid case um, for um, a smaller independent state um, to, to remain within the European Union and to exercise the powers that membership gives you. Thank you. I will go on discussing with you, but I can't, so we will discuss in the afternoon. Uh, venga, va, galera. Bye. Tonya, microfono. Bai, mila esker, e, aberi jaunari, bere intervenzioa oso interesgarri ero ditu zait, eta egia esan galdera oso zehatza egin nahi nion e, Europa Arbatasunaren jarrerari buruz. Niri garai batean tokatu zitzaidan anbarrutik esagutzea Europa Arbatasuna, parlamentarioa esan nintzen Europako Parlamentuan, eta ikusi nuen garai hartan, justu laro eta bederatzi, laro eta mar, laro eta maika urte horietan, ekialdeko estatua formatu zirenean, Europa Arbatasunak nola baita esatearren jarrera nahiko aktiboa hartu zuen estatu berri hori ei bidea errasteko. Egia da, estatu batzuen kasuan, gutxiengoak, estatu berri horietako gutxiengoak errespetatzeko, gutxiengo ungariarrak, eta bat, errespetatzeko baldintza jarri zituela, baina oro har, esango nuke, anbarrutik ikusita Europako Parlamentutik, Oso aldekotasuna hondia agertu zuela eta errastu egin zuela estatu berri horien sorrera. Gogoratzen naiz, esate baterako, nola Estonia, Letonia eta Lituaniako ordezkariak orain dikere estatu independente etzirela, prozesu horretan zeudela, ordez, behin behineko ordezkari, ordezkaritzak bazituzten Europar Batasunean eta egoitzak eta bulegoa zituzten parlamentu barruan ere bai. Eta lanzbergeiz jauna, esate baterako, lehen presidente biakatu zena, bueno, ba, Estrasburgon e, ikusi nuen nik lan egiten, galderak egiten, eta prozesu horretaz, hau da, esango nuke Estonia, Letonia eta Lituaniaren prozesu konstituzio gilea, egiten ari zen bitartean, ba, Europar batasun barruan ere lagundu zela, eta toki bat, hau da, prozesu konstituzio gile bera egiten lagundu zuela Europar batasunak. Claro, orain Kataluniari buruz hitz egin duenean bere jarrera nolabait esan hotzegia iruditu zait. Batez ere bigarren puntuan. Nota hartu dut eta ondo ulertu badut esan du lehenengo puntuan Europar Batasuna kuriosidades jarraitzen duela prozesua eta elkarrizketaren aldekoa dela. Bigarren puntuan aldiz esan du ez duela inola ere kuestioan jarriko Espainiaren, hau da Madrilen jarrera konstituzioaren irakurketan. Hori zurrunegia iruditu zait. Eta irugarrenez, esan du, ala ere, e, erabakitzea oinarrizko eskubidetzat hartzen dela. Baina, bigarren puntu horretan, egia esaten badiot, aberi jaunari, iruditzen zait oso zurruna dela jarrera hori. Eta ez dator bat, ez Europar Batasunak aurreko, nik lehen aipatu dudan, laro eta bederatzi, laro eta mar, urte horietan, ekialdeko estatu berri horiekin, edo oraindik estatu ezirela, Las Bergins Jaunari, por ejemplo, eman zion laguntzarekin, ez da ere, ez dator bat, beste ere batean kokatuta, Kanadako Tribunal Supremoak kebeken kasuan hartu zuen jarrerarekin. Hau da, parte biak behartu negoziatzera. Dani galdetzen dut, hemen dator galdera. Ez da posible Europar Batasunak jarrera exigenteagoa izatea Madrilekin behin kostatatu duenean, berakondo esan duen bezala, Madrileko gobernuaren jarrera orain ezezko gorobila besterik ez dela. Hau da, ezin dio Europar Batasunak demokraziaren izenean. Eskatu Kataluniari prozesu konstituzio gile garden bat bai, baina ere, era berean Madrileri ere esigitu negoziazioaren aldeko jarrera bat eta erreferenduna errespetatzen duen jarrera bat eskatzea hori da nire galdera. Ondo ulertzen bada? Thank you for that <coughs> very pertinent question. <coughs> and speaking with your experience in the European Parliament, I think you have all the more authority uh, to make these remarks. <coughs> You're absolutely correct to say that for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, 
the European Union in the 90s and the beginning of, of um, the last 10 years <coughs> has been more than helpful for these countries to join the European Union. We have given them money, we have given them technical assistance, we've given them encouragement. But I want to make a distinction. Um, you, you mentioned it yourself. You, you said that the European Union <coughs> facilitated uh, the creation of these countries and their joining the European Union. It's not the case that the European Union facilitated the creation of these countries. It's a historical fact that um, when the Soviet Union was on the point of disintegration and the Latvians, the Lithuanians and the Estonians were talking about independence, the rest of us, we, we were very nervous. We, we didn't want to encourage it. So the European Union w was quite hesitant about the creation. I, I, I insist again on the creation. We saw the same thing when Yugoslavia broke up. Um, we made some uh, very pious statements about we in Europe would help to the reorganization of, of, of the region, but in reality there was chaos, there was civil war, many people were killed. <clears throat> so we weren't involved in the creative process, but we were, and I entirely agree with what you say, we were involved in the joining of the countries. And the the stabilization of these countries um, before they joined the European Union, we played an important part. We played an important part because, as you say, um, we insisted on a certain number of conditions that member states of the European Union should respect democracy, the rule of law, respect of minorities and, and a functioning market economy and a whole lot of other things. And we insisted that they had to do that. Uh, not least in the case of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, which when you think for a moment, uh, it's amazing the progress these countries have made in the last 25 years. Um, it may be um, sometimes difficult and irritating for you in the Basque country to be in a certain sense in Spain, but just imagine what it was like to be in the Soviet Union. Um, these three Baltic states are in fact quite sympathetic, I would say, more sympathetic than some of the other member states to independence movements uh, in other parts of the European Union. But I don't want to create any illusions. The heads of government of the three Baltic states are extremely prudent in what they say about interfering in what they consider to be uh, Spanish affairs. Now, on, on this question of the conditions for membership, I, I think it's important to understand that <clears throat> the conditions I mentioned, democracy, rule of war, and so on, um, they apply to outsiders. Um, countries which are already in the European Union are supposed to respect these conditions already, and largely they do. I mean, for me, it's quite clear. Uh, that in the Basque country, in Catalonia, in Spain more generally, um, you fulfill all the conditions necessary for membership of the European Union from the point of view of the famous criteria. What's the same for Scotland? I mean, in some ways, you're better placed here than the Scots. The Scots found themselves in the embarrassing situation um, that they don't have the euro. Um, and, and that was one of the big problems in their independence debate, was that they would have to stick with the British pound. Uh, you in the Basque country and in Catalonia, you already got the euro, so in a certain sense, you're further ahead. Um, I think, in conclusion, I would say, uh, you shouldn't expect the other member states to make public expressions uh, of um, involvement uh, in the debate in this country. But you can certainly expect them to make private expressions um, diplomatically and between politicians if Madrid does not pay attention to the developing situation. Okay, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if we conceive Europe as something else than the European Union, but something more similar to a constitutional network, 
and therefore we also take into account the European Convention apart from the European Union, we find that as an underlying um, goal, it's protecting diversity. And we can find this when they refer to the constitutional identity of the states or when they apply the margin of appreciation measures regarding the European Court of Human Rights. But I'm not really sure what all these institutions are trying to protect when they try to protect diversity because from one hand, we see that whenever it's uh, something related to minorities, not only national minorities, but also ethnic minorities like gypsies or Jewish people in Hungary, France, and so on, they are not really making big efforts to protect those minorities. But in the meanwhile, we see that, as in the case of Luxembourg's uh, unfair or unbalanced tax system, the prisoner's right to vote ban in the UK, and so on, we see that Europe is taking really not big um, efforts to uh, stop or to block the argument based on diversity that basically is going against a fair integration. So, once again, what is Europe exactly trying to protect when they refer to diversity? On the question of language, which is a very important question for you here, and of course in Catalonia, and, and, and in my native country. I was going to speak some Welsh here, but I'm not quite sure if that's fair on the interpreters. But at least I will say three words of Welsh. Um, the Welsh flag is uh, the Welsh dragon. I don't know if you recognize that. It's a beautiful red dragon. And in Welsh, the word for the red dragon is Idrai Goch. So I said some Welsh here. Let, let me get back to the question. Um, on the question of languages, the European Union has made a considerable effort. Now, we have to make a distinction here between the official languages in which the official journal is printed and, and the laws are drawn up, and there, the official languages, I think we now have 23, um, they are what the individual member states um, request. But in addition to that, the European Union, the European Commission, has a policy on language diversification. If you write in Basque to the president of the European Commission, he is obliged to reply to you in Basque. So there are rules which respect the language diversity. Your question, of course, was of a much more general nature, <coughs> where you asked what is really happening um, to fulfill this uh, principle of, 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 of unity and diversity. Isn't there a tendency towards more harmonization? My answer is no. It's, it's one of the fundamental debates which took place about the creation of the single market. Um, one of the key elements in the single market is, is not that the same rules should be applied everywhere, on products, on services, but that there should be a minimum set of rules which everyone should respect. And it's of enormous importance, particularly in the, in the field of economic activity, that you have uh, fair and equal rules of competition um, so, so that it really is a single market. More generally, the principle of subsidiarity is now much more implemented and affirmed within the European Union. The principle of subsidiarity means that decisions should only be taken at the European level if it can be proved that it's better to take them at the European level than at the local, regional or national level. In the case of the Euro, and the Eurozone, <clears throat> we're faced with a situation where there has to be a further move towards integration of the financial system, precisely in order to control, on the one hand, the banks, to avoid some of these terrible situations that we've experienced through not only the corruption, but sometimes the failure of banks. And secondly, we need more integration, to control and avoid the risk 
of, of public debts um, becoming exaggerated. So it's true that in the Eurozone, there is going to be more integration and more coordination of economic policy. But it's not the case for me that the European Union is becoming less diverse. For me, it becomes more diverse every day, and this is a principle which is well understood in Brussels. Um, yes, as you said, I think um, it is a normal thing that we have seen in, in Europe, this pragmatic approach uh, usually says that a state doesn't want to interfere to, to disturb another country, uh, <coughs> especially if you don't know what it would lead to and if an independence process will be successful or not. But things change when they succeed and when they get independence, as you said, Europe becomes very pragmatic. Um, now things come, as we have seen, for instance, in Catalonia, which can be a reality in the near future, that since the constitution or the interpretation of the constitution bans a referendum to be called, there could be a democratic mandate, which means political parties advocating independence, clearly saying, if you vote for me, I will declare independence. If we face this situation, a UDI, a unilateral declaration of independence, are we sure which would, would be the approach of the European Union in that case? And I mean, uh, of course, as I said before, the case is no, they don't, they don't want to disturb Spain. But once you face this situation, we have seen what's happened in Kosovo, we have seen what The Hague has responded to that, you these are not illegal by definition. Um, so are we sure that perhaps Brussels in the first moment might say no, but at the same time we have sovereign states that might recognize their parliaments, I don't know, Finland, Sweden, some countries with a deep democratic culture, if they have seen that there has been a process uh, where the state didn't want to negotiate, when they have seen we tried everything, we went to the polls and people voted for this. And I would even say, uh, I think it was Xavier Salai Martin, the professor that uh, asked in Davos to uh, Durao Barroso, well, Recently, new countries came to Europe that were uh, uh, born out of wars. Croatia, even Slovenia, had a small war with the Yugoslav Federal Army uh, when it was born. So when we are trying to form a new country by democratic means, you are telling us no. Uh, do you really think or do you realize what people might um, understand of all of this? I don't know if you can answer to that. Well, you, <coughs> you asked me about the scenario in which one or other region makes a unilateral declaration of independence. Um, I said in my presentation, now I've got to be prudent, okay? We're talking here, you are talking here about a hypothetical situation at a certain point, you even talked about war. For God's sake, let's not talk about war. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Let's keep this debate civilized. Um, but, but I must be candid with you. In, in the hypothetical situation which you mentioned, um, what, what would be the response of the other member states of the European Union and the European Union as an organization. Well, what happened with Kosovo gives you an indication. I don't think any other member state would recognize a unilateral declaration of independence by a region of an existing member state. I have to tell you the truth. I didn't come here to, to, to encourage you in false ideas. Indeed, the result for that region would probably be worse than Kosovo because at least what... Uh, most of the member states recognize Kosovo. I don't think any of the member states uh, would feel able to recognize a region which made a region within the European Union which made a unilateral declaration of independence. That doesn't mean they wouldn't be concerned. We would be talking about a crisis 
but I have to be candid with you about the question of, of recognition. Now, one of the remarks you made <clears throat> is that <clears throat> the European Union seems to be saying no, no, no. That's not true. Um, me, so far as I represent the European Union, I've been trying to say to you, yes, you should have this debate. You need to have this debate. You need to have this dialogue. You need to have it here. We outside in the European Union, we can't do it for you. And in that sense, it's a bit like the story with the countries that applied to join the European Union. We said to them, you must make political and economic reforms, you must have better governance, but you have to do it for yourselves. We can't replace you. Um, uh, after all, self-governance means uh, governing for yourself. So the message I want to give is that for the European Union, it's important for you to find a solution and then we will accept it. Uh, one more question. The, okay. Um, to me, it's really interesting. Um, sorry, here at the back. Uh, it's really interesting the European citizenship uh, dimension of these uh, secession movements and uh, until what point. Um, Sorry, okay, here. Uh, until which point uh, the European Union citizenship rights can play a role in uh, regarding these processes and the accommodation in Europe? And in particular, I wanted to ask if you see feasible uh, the participation or the taking part by the uh, Court of the European Union at some point in order to defend some citizen rights, or if it would be likely to expect a decision where uh, the court would make it or uh, consider it very difficult to see five million uh, inhabitants in some point or citizens leave the EU. So. Well, I, I, I hope I understood the question correctly about European citizenship and I think in the context, in this scenario, of, of, of a country which becomes independent. Well, here again, this is hypothetical, but it's not entirely hypothetical because in the Scottish debate, um, there was a lot of focus on this question of citizenship. And um, many of the commentators in the Scottish debate, the legal experts, focused on the fact that the, the population of Scotland, of five million Scottish people, they, they have European citizenship, and um, if Scotland had declared independence, and if the European Union had not accepted Scotland immediately as a member, would Scots still have European citizenship? And, and many of the best lawyers argued, yes, we would have an absurd situation where five million people in, in a third country would still have European citizenship. And that's, that was a very strong argument in the case of Scotland, why it would have been impossible and impractical and morally and legally wrong to tell Scotland to leave the European Union after independence. The, the best solution for Scotland, the common sense solution, would have been for Scotland's membership of the European Union to come into force on the day of independence. And, and I think that was well understood by the experts in citizenship.